Hi everyone, we're just waiting for our guest of the, e of the evening. And she's just on her way. Hi. Hey, Dre. How are you? I'm really well, thank you. How are you? Really well, thanks. Yeah. Hello. Um, everyone, hi. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, my name's Andrea. I'm the deputy editor here at Rush. And I'm here with sexologist Juliet Allen. Um, who's here to talk to us about pleasure, self-pleasure, relationships, and with a bit of particular focus um, on the time of COVID, which is an interesting time for those. Um, before we go any further, um, we want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live and recognise their continuing connection to land, water, and community. Um, I acknowledge that I am today on Gadigal land and I pay respect to elders past, present, and emerging. And, yeah. um, and you're in South Australia. I am, sorry. Sorry for cutting you off. No. Um, I'm in South Australia and I would love to acknowledge the Nakuna people whose, whose land I'm currently visiting here. Um, well, I'm calling in from my bedroom, which feels appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> and you're travelling at the moment. Yeah, we are. My family and I are travelling around Australia, so we're in South Australia at the moment, living in our caravan and just loving being in nature and enjoying this beautiful country. Yes, sounds, sounds really cleansing and beautiful. Um, so we're chatting today and the questions are not coming from me today. Um, I'll, yeah. <laughs> probably good to point that out anyway they're <laughs> wonderful questions um they've come from our community they've sent them in um via instagram and we want to thank everyone for sending those through and sharing so much with us and um it's really so many so many points to think on and, and really important topics so if you notice me um glancing down that's because i'm i'm reading from the questions um is there anything you'd like to say before we start julia um, no, just thanking everybody for writing in and asking the questions. You know, I know that this topic is, can be a sensitive one and it's, it's quite taboo still and it takes bravery and courage to, you know, write in and ask what, what you've been thinking. And I just want to let people know who've asked questions that, um, your question isn't just, you know, the answer isn't just for you that I guarantee there's other people listening who also have the same question. So, yeah, so thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to turn my light up because it's in my eyes and uh, get straight into it. Um, hey. So the first couple of questions uh, relate to the situation that a lot of people are in at the moment, um, being isolated, dealing with new things in terms of, um, coronavirus crisis. Um, the first one is, how do you stop feeling extremely single during COVID when all your friends are in relationships? Hmm. I've had a lot of people ask me this. I think single people are struggling, you know, during COVID just as much as actually partnered people are. We all have our different challenges in this time. Um, reality is you're single. And I think COVID... First of all, being single isn't a bad thing. It's actually a really great opportunity to create a really beautiful relationship with ourselves. And what I've noticed about COVID is that the people who are, I guess, making the most of this um, unusual situation is the single people who are seeing it as that opportunity to really reconnect in. And because, you know, the, the relationship we have with ourselves is the num it should be our number one so i my advice is instead of seeing it as a negative get um really into self-pleasure and into you know understanding your pleasure more and your turn-ons and know that eventually we will be out of this stage in the world and there will be the opportunity for you to meet new lovers but for now you're single and you're just going to have to embrace it beautiful um the next one is quite similar. It's kind of, I guess, the next stage along. Um, someone's met someone during lockdown. 
Um, and they're asking, how do I ease into more intimacy for new relationships being developed in lockdown? Mm. Okay. Um, well, there's the obvious one, which is online intimacy. So video calls and phone calls and sending pictures to each other and just developing the relationship in that way, which I also see as a really good opportunity too, because a lot of us, when COVID's not about, we a lot of us rush into new relationships and rush into sex and you know we skip the part that we can have which is really like deepening intimacy in different ways so um i see this as a good opportunity for you to do that and yeah. ways that you can deepen intimacy without actually having you know physical sex is to be more open, to, to open up about how you're feeling, to talk about your heart and your heart's like yearnings and just to really develop intimacy in a different way that perhaps you haven't considered before. Beautiful. Um, how do you, how do I shake things up with my boyfriend during COVID? <laughs> Asking oh. for this person. Nothing seems spontaneous. Oh yeah, this is a big one. So many couples have come to me and are just pulling each other's hair out or pulling their own hair out, just being in a confined space or, you know, both working from home and going from having the day apart, which creates more polarity and creates more, like, sexual tension to being together all the time. So if you're a couple and you're struggling, you're not alone. I mean, my partner and I are currently in a situation where we live in a caravan together, so I get it. We're in a small, <laughs> confined space. And it definitely changes the dynamic. So um, what was the question? How can they... How can they shake spice? things up? We got a lot of... Yeah, spice things up, shake things up. We got a lot of questions like this one. Yeah, okay. So the first thing I can think of is both of you coming together and think like telling each other what do you need in this time like what do you need support in so for um, a lot of couples and especially for men they need space or for women who just really enjoy solitude um we need space so it's about supporting each other in that whether that's just that you're both in separate rooms for half a day and you just commit to giving each other time out and not do what i do a lot which is like go in and be like hey like what are you doing Do you, want to come <laughs> you know so I know a personal example is my partner Nick I know he loves solitude and if I don't like give him that he gets really like agitated which then creates tension and and less sexual tension so think about what your relationship needs talk to each other and then support each other in that so that you can get your own personal needs met first Spend, spend less time together in, you know, even if it's just in different rooms. And from there, is that where the sexual tension comes in because you're missing each other? Yeah, it's just because you're spending, you know, the more time we spend together, it's funny when we, like, when we're in love or we're in relationship, we can want to spend every hour of the day together. Mm. But when we're always together, that actually creates less polarity. And by that I mean mm -hmm. less, like you know, positive and negative pole, which creates friction. Friction. It's like um, we just come together, we do everything together, and then we don't appreciate each other as much. And um, so, yeah, it's a tricky one. You know, the other thing to note is it's a really unusual time. And in, in the history of the world, we've never actually experienced this. Like humanity hasn't experienced this type of isolation and um, pandemic. So also know that, if you have a low libido or if you're both just suddenly not wanting sex, that's okay. It's, it's like, it's actually really normal and things will change eventually. So, so my other piece of advice is to stick in there and not put too much pressure on the relationship to be, you know, all spicy in this time. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot going on. Yeah. Um, a little bit of a different one. Um, could be related to the current time, but more general. Um, how do you overcome the fear of intimacy? Oh, yeah. Okay. So um, what I teach about sex and intimacy is we need to come at it from a really holistic place. And so um, I would recommend for the person who asked that to seek some support in going back in, right back into childhood and then through teenage years and, and everything that's happened to us in life. 
and look at the role models we had. Who did we look up to to model intimacy when we were children? And what experience did you have um, or experiences have you had that have, um, I guess, given you a fear of intimacy now in adult life? So it's all about going back and, and undoing and going through the trauma and unlearning what we've learned so that we can get to a place where as an adult, we can explore intimacy more freely and more openly. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Mm. Um, I found this question really interesting. Um, all of them interesting, but um, this struck a chord. How do I go about finding like-minded people who are more spiritual and open sexually? Like I think mm. there's a sort of like dating with those of your interests can be quite different to, you know, going out and meeting someone at a bar or Tinder because you might not want to meet someone that way. Yeah. Well, firstly, if you want to date more spiritual, um, what, did, what was it, spiritual and interesting people? How do I go about finding like-minded, open people um, who are more spiritual and open sexually, which I guess could mean a lot of things. But Yeah. Yeah, I get asked this a lot. My first piece of advice is to just keep on working on your own spirituality and your own open-mindedness around sex because mm -hmm. I do believe that the people that we attract into our lives are a mirror of ourselves in a lot of ways. And so if you find yourself attracting in people who are not spiritual and not open-minded, then it, it's like, hmm, where, what part of me, I would question what part of me is still needs more work in that area of my life. So that's, that's one piece of advice. And then if you're really interested in open-minded, um, you know, sexuality and, and meeting people who are open-minded, then look into doing like workshops or courses or um, mm -hmm. retreats where those types of people spend time. And a lot of the time it's in tantra retreats or tantra yeah. workshops. There's a lot of open-mindedness in that community. Um I run a pleasure school and there's a beautiful community of people in there who are all interested in the same thing. And yeah. so that's a great way to meet people is to just join something like that where you know that there's women and men in there who are committed to deepening their practice in, in the area of sexuality. Yeah. Sex and, yeah. That sounds great. Um, yeah. Are agreed threesomes in a relationship emotional cheating and unhealthy or not oh i like this one mm. well there's no black and white answer to that i'm i i believe we can have um really great threesomes that are not emotional cheating at all and if you want to have a great threesome i actually just put a an article there's a few articles on my journal about this but you need to have um, really great communication and before the threesome takes place, set up the boundaries, set up the expectations, um, talk about what everyone, what the three people need to feel to open and what they're going to need afterward. So if that's all spoken about before the threesome happens, then that sets us up for a way more successful threesome than one where we kind of jump in because it feels good and then something happens and then someone's triggered and then it turns into a shit show, basically. <laughs> um, yeah. I've experienced it all and I can tell you that communicating beforehand is the key to having a really, um, you know, beautiful experience. And um, I don't necessarily think it's emotional cheating, no, but I think that, you know, there's can definitely be disasters too. So educate yourself about how to have a great threesome first. Beautiful. Um, someone's written in to say um, it's been one year without sex with their partner uh, focused on an exam. It's not clear whether the partner or the person who's written in is focused on an exam. Um, they said it's killing me. Any advice? Mm. Okay, so one year without sex, for some mm -hmm. couples that's, that's quite okay, for others that's just mm -hmm. a disaster. So mm -hmm. it sounds like this person is written in because it's affecting them and they're feeling yeah. like, oh, this just doesn't feel good. Mm -hmm. If focusing on exams has been your priority, 
and I know because I've been to uni and how stressful that can be, then um, that's been your priority. Now that the exams are over, if they are, refocus your priority into bringing more intimacy and connection into your relationship. Sit down with your partner and talk to them about, you know, the fact that this is really important to you and get an understanding of um, if they're on the same page, if they too want to prioritise sex. And if they do, then talk about ways in which you can prioritise it. I mean, you know, it's just, it all comes down to what we prioritise in life. And sex needs to be one of them if that's important to us. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, our next question, um, someone's written in and said, I often feel depleted when having orgasms too often. What's your take on that? Mm, good one. So I'm not sure whether they're, um, this is coming from a woman identified person or a man, um, but orgasms can be quite depleting. There's, you know, orgasms are fun and they feel really great, but it depends on the orgasm that we're having. If it's a man, then ejaculating physically during orgasm can be very depleting because it's depleting us of our chi and our life force energy as a man, if we're a man. As women, if we're having a lot of clitoral orgasms, then it's similar to ejaculation in that we are, we are, all our sexual energy is going down through our lower chakras and it's creating more depletion. So there's that feeling of like, oh, relaxation and you want to sleep afterwards a lot in general. And that's okay. And, and you know, I have clitoral orgasms all the time. However, I do notice that when I don't, and a lot of my clients are the same when I don't always have um, a clitoral orgasm and instead either don't have an orgasm at all or have like um, bring my energy up into my body and have a full body orgasm, then I actually feel more energized through the day. And a lot of men report this who choose not to ejaculate. They report that, you know, back to me and my partner is the same, is that he feels like he has a lot more energy to give into his relationship, into his family, his purpose in life, etc. So... I talk about this a lot um, in my podcast and in Pleasure School. There's a lot of practices in there for people who do want to conserve their energy in this way. Okay, great. Well, that's mm. definitely worth a read for anyone also experiencing that. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, someone has asked about their partner who's a male. Um, how can I show him prioritising his health for longevity and better, clearer sexual connection is key? Do you want me to say that on uh, Okay, so just prioritise your own health first. Stop, mm. stop. Often when we want our partner to change or we want them to do something, it's what we need to do more of ourselves. So, you know, I want you to be more healthy or I want you to be more present or I want you to study more, whatever. We then have to point the finger back to us and look at, oh, where do I need that more to? So first prioritise your own health and you will inspire him just naturally without doing anything other than committing to that and prioritising that. Um, and then there's only so much that we can get our partners to do the more I find the more that we like want to control them and tell them what's right for them and what's going to make them feel better often the more our partners will want to do the exact opposite depending on their personality yeah so um we just need to lead by example and hope that you know for this person you ask hope that your partner follows with you and you know, if he doesn't, it, it may mean that you actually have really different differing values in life and that health is not a top value for him. And that's when you need to ask yourself, you know, can I accept that part of him that he doesn't value health? And can we move forward with me feeling happy in this relationship if that's the case? Yeah, great. Thank mm. you. Mm. Um, what's more important, physical connection or emotional connection? Uh, I would say both. Yeah. I would say both are equally as important. Um, emotional co connection is super. You can't just have, have like a yes at your sex centre and feel really turned on all the time. 
well, you can, and we've, a lot of us have experienced that, but what it leads to is really hot sex and then usually feeling really disconnected and really dissatisfied afterwards. Or if you have a really strong emotional connection, that can be really beautiful, but what can happen is you can just turn into best friends and not want to have sex. So I believe that both are equally as important. Mm. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Um, someone has written in to say um, that they're looking for womb or yoni healing and they don't know where or how to start. And what would you recommend? Oh, okay. Mm. Well, that's cool that they want to, like, explore that. Um <laughs> And I really am a big fan of yoni healing and womb healing and I have experienced it a lot myself. You know, it's helped me heal from um, trauma in that area of my body. It's helped me heal from, like, losing, a, like, babies, all sorts of things. So um, I just recommend if you're looking for a, a yoni uh, massage practitioner or a womb healing session that you get a referral from somebody you know. Don't just Google it. Because like any industry, there are people who are not practicing with integrity. So, um, yeah, you know, you can, you can email me and I can refer you to someone if that's what you're interested in. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. Um, when can I start calling him my boyfriend? Oh, that's it. I like that one. Yeah. When, <laughs> I don't know. Well... <laughs> have a conversation with him and ask him, like, are we, you know, is this official? Are we together? Are you my boyfriend? And, um, or just start calling him your boyfriend. Just do what feels right for you. But I recommend just having a conversation with your new lover. And that's what I do. It's like, hey, you know, what is this? Are we committed mm -hmm. to each other? Are we monogamous? Are we, what, what do you want? What setup do you want in this relationship? I'm ready to commit. And if he is too, then it's, it's, um, and it's unanimous and you can start calling each other boyfriend, girlfriend. Beautiful. If someone's kind of, um, nervous about having that conversational communication, what would you recommend? Um, I would recommend really like dropping into what does your heart want to say and get out of your head. Because we can get so caught up in like what you think, what we think we should say, how we think he or she will react, what's the best way to say it. But if we just take a few deep breaths and like close our eyes and put our hands on our heart and be like, what does my heart want to say? Like, how do I want to express myself from this part of my body? Then that often allows the words to flow like more organically and with more ease. And that goes with any difficult conversation. If you find a conversation difficult with a, with a lover, then, yeah, drop into your heart. So does that answer it or is that a bit too yeah. airy-fairy? No, I think that does. I think that does. Absolutely. Um, how to get your sex drive back after having babies when you're so tired and a little resentful? Oh, yeah, so many mums experience this, you know. Um, it's really, really common and we can feel really depleted after we've had a baby because we've, we've gone through, like, huge process and initiation into motherhood through birth and then we're up all night with, with often a child who's breastfeeding lots, etc. So, firstly, just letting you know you're not alone. Um, what was the question again? Because I've just, like... Um, my, well, this person uh, wants to know how they can get their drive back. Um, they're still feeling tired and they're also feeling a little bit resentful. Yeah, okay. Um, so it's important to name that you're feeling resentful, firstly, because mm -hmm. otherwise if you just keep holding that in, you're going to feel more and more resentful, which is <laughs> going to lead to feeling yuck. Mm -hmm. um, and how you can get your drive back is... Um, to ensure that you're resting and I know with a new baby that can be really tricky but it's about asking for support and you know it takes it takes a village to raise a child not just one or two people mm -hmm. so asking for anyone around you to help you to come and cook or to come and hold the baby while you have a shower or a little sleep or do do that as much as possible ask for what you need if you have a partner who's there to support you ask for what you need from them you don't have to do it alone and then also trust that your sex drive will come back it's just going to take a little bit of time 
and trust in your body and know that right now your priority is meant to be the baby and that's just real the reality of motherhood as hard as hard as it is sometimes so also no don't don't put pressure on yourself it will come back yeah 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 um the next question is um someone's asked how to have casual sex um when you have mental health or attachment issues due to childhood trauma okay I wouldn't have casual sex if you have, um, if it doesn't feel right for you. Casual sex can be really fun, but it can also be really traumatic. And um, if you do have childhood trauma, I recommend, like I said in one of the earlier questions, to, to get some support, you know, find a therapist who you resonate with or a coach mm -hmm. or somebody who you can talk to about resolving that, you know, that childhood trauma and going back and, figuring out how it has um, traumatised you. And, and, you know, that's a scary thing. It, it can be really scary, but it's a really brave thing to do because what it will do is free you up mm. to be able to go into sexual experiences with more ease and more confidence and feeling less attachment if you do want to have casual sex. But right now I don't recommend casual sex if, if that doesn't feel right for you. Sounds like great advice. Thank you. Um, someone is newly single after a long-term relationship and they've asked for tips for using dating apps. Oh, yeah. I just have one tip and that is <laughs> only swipe right if there's still swipe right, swipe left. I haven't been single for a while, but, you know, I definitely frequented Tinder when I was just for um, research. Um, into the industry as you have to in my industry but um I my my rule from like a personal point of view was only swiping right if I had like a full body yes if I was like yes I like no hesitation yeah. this guy or this girl looks really amazing I like the way they've written about themselves and I have a full body yes if you don't have a yes just don't otherwise you're just going to spend so much time chatting to all these different people and it's just a waste of time when you could be hanging out with yourself or with your friends. So my other piece of advice is don't meet up with someone unless you've had a good phone conversation with them first. Yeah. Um, lots of people learn this the hard way and meet up and then they're stuck with someone that they don't have a connection with. So give them your number, take it off the app, have a phone call and then talk from there. Great advice. Thank you. Um, is it possible to rekindle a broken relationship? Yeah, I think it is. I mean, it depends how broken it is. It, mm -hmm. There's so many different layers to that word of broken and a broken relationship. But I do believe that it's, um, it's possible to rekindle relationships. I believe that, you know, having a break in a relationship can be a really positive thing. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that you can get back together successfully after a breakup. So... It's just it's just about finding the right support again, and I'm big on this, so that you can um, shine a light on where it's not working or where you need to do the self work and bring in, you know, like a more a different view into the relationship so that it can it can flourish and grow. So my answer is yes, I do believe that you can rekindle. Beautiful. How do you stay connected with your partner when you're six months apart due to COVID? Oh, that's tough. So many couples yeah. would be separated in this time. Yeah. Well, it, it, I mean, we're lucky in that we have, you know, online ways these days. <laughs> um, so I would recommend doing a lot of video calls. I would recommend if you're in different time zones, setting up a daily time where it both suits your time zone where you both commit to be online and, and yeah. stay connected so it may be having like a daily day uh, a daily date where you know that you're both there um and just having really great communication about how you're feeling because it can be very easy to not speak openly and honestly about how we're feeling when when yeah you've been apart for so long it's just it's so much easier just to push stuff down but be honest and um 
and just yeah it's it's a tricky one because it's something that a lot of people are experiencing but have never experienced before and they're not choosing it either it's not like it's they're choosing a long distance relationship so yeah, yeah lots of communication how do you deal with kind of uncertainty in relationships because that's a huge one isn't it like it's like okay it's not we don't know exactly how long we'll spend apart like, mm. how does that <clears throat> yeah so if you're in a committed relationship and you know the boundaries within the relationship, so for example, you know that you're both have committed to a monogamous relationship um, mm. and that's an important one to chat about. Like, is this, do we both commit to monogamy or are we open? Because when we live apart and we're forced to live apart, we can go into like uncertainty around well, is he or she going to be talking to other people or will they now have a lover wherever they are? All these things that we worry about. Mm. But if we can communicate, you know, if we're in a monogamous relationship, what does that look like? What, where, what are the boundaries? Um, what happens if X, Y, Z? And so it's like you set up a bit of a, um, like an agreement, a relationship agreement so that there's boundaries so that you can relax back into whatever it is into the relationship mm -hmm. and with the uncertainty you know when you don't know when you're going to see each other I, I don't know exactly how to answer that it's really tricky it's I guess it's about surrendering into the unknown and mm -hmm. having deep trust that this is all unfolding for a reason on the planet but that's easier said than done um yeah because I'm not in that situation yeah. so yeah I feel for that person and those people mm. I guess that, but I guess that surrendering to the unknown can apply to so many different avenues of life, right? And that seems to be the only way yeah. to not have an existential yeah. crisis in any kind of case. Oh, That's great. Definitely. I said everything. It's just so easy for people to say, though, like people mm. say to me about, you know, parts of my life, and I'm just like, oh. That's so easy for you to say you're not in my situation. So I really get that it's it's hard to hear that when you're so in a challenge. But, yeah, um, yeah it's something to really work on for everybody. Yeah, mm -hmm. something to work on. Nothing is certain. The only thing that's certain is, is death and birth. Like, we know that you know we're going to keep birthing new children are come going to come into the world and we know that one day we're going to die. In fact, the only certainty is death. So everything yeah. else is just mystery and a bonus <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah <laughs> um someone has been seeing a guy for two months now um the sex was great but now they hardly have it um they'd like to know how to ask for more um and they say they feel quite shy mm. okay well it's pretty normal, firstly, to feel shy when we talk about sex because we mm. haven't, most of us haven't grown up with any education or holistic education around how to talk about sex. So um, I would say this for any relationship, not just a two-month relationship, whether it's two years or 20 years, what I would do would just firstly ask my partner, when's a good time to talk to you about something that's important to me? So firstly, what you're doing is not just like launching on them and, and being like, I need to talk to you about this. You're not doing this right. Then, you know, Because then what you're going to get is probably a reaction from them and they're not going to be able to listen. So first ask, when's an important time to talk to you about something that's important to me? And then if they say now, then be like, awesome. If it's tomorrow, whatever. And then just sit down and say, you know, I really loved when we were making love a lot. Like, it felt so good. I felt really connected to you I love connecting to your body and your heart and I loved having heaps of sex with you and I've noticed that lately we're not um, enjoying as much sex and you know um, I would love to prioritize intimacy more with you is that something that we can do together is that is that important for you too and often you know if you do have that conversation your partner will be thinking the same thing and they may just feel like, oh, okay, she or he is also feeling the absence of sex. And, you know, it's a brave thing to come to a partner and say that. So that's how I would recommend approaching it. Cool. Mm. And I noticed you kind of phrase a positive 
first in connected now. Oh yeah. So you yeah. do the sandwich, it's like positive. <laughs> so you've got to start with positive and then you put in the challenge or whatever and then you end with a positive. So yeah, yeah. you want there's always a positive. You can always find a positive and so it's important to start with that. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah. This is our last audience question. I noticed we've got one in the feed there as well. But um, how do you know when someone's right for you? Mm. Well, we've got about, confirm me, we've got about 10 minutes. Is that right? Yeah. Like in our time frame that we've agreed to. Yeah. So I, I teach this thing and I'm going to do it really quickly and it's called the four centres and basically... I go into this extensively in pleasure school. So if you're interested in learning more and if you're interested in like have been in a guided meditation around this, then I recommend going into pleasure school and doing that online. But the four centers are our sex center at our genitals, our tummy, which is located our tummy. That's our intuition, our heart center and our head. And ultimately if someone, if you're seeking a long-term relationship, or even just a one night stand, ultimately we want to be looking for a connection that is a yes at all four centers. So yes at our sex, which is like a strong sexual connection. Yes at our tummy, which means our intuition says yes. Yes at our heart, which is like a feeling this strong heart connection. And then yes at our head and our head is like that little voice that just is constantly mm -hmm. analyzing, but our head's like, yes. Yeah. So the way I know and how I choose being, um, you know committing to someone is having noticing when i have a yes at all four centers and it's just this deep inner knowing that you know that person is like right for you at this time in your life so yeah that's actually the short version and um i guess it's just like a feeling that we get yeah yeah, yeah. i did notice one um if we do have time for one more question sure um and just try and remember it but it was a question about um libido um and wanting mm. to get back the person is 19 and feeling alienated as all their friends are having a, have high sex drives but they're not, not feeling that way okay yeah thanks for asking um like low libido is one of the biggest challenges that people face when they come to me you know that's like one of the biggest reasons people come to me for support mm -hmm. so this question is going to answer so many other people's <laughs> questions around mm -hmm. libido um so it's it's pretty common to experience changes in our libido first through our lifetime and it just depends on life events like death mm -hmm. um birth um work stresses COVID has been really has had such a huge impact on people's libido due to loss of jobs due to stress having kids at home etc etc the list goes on mm -hmm. so many people on the planet right now are experiencing collectively I believe and this is from hearing a lot about what's going on in people's sex lives are experiencing low libido and so the first place to look is looking at it from a health point of view. Where in your life, like, are you prioritizing eating really alive foods that are going to feed your body beautiful chi and beautiful energy? Because we need to have a great sex drive. I personally believe and teach that we need to be really prioritizing our health. So movement, um, like, which is exercise, eating well, sleeping well is really important drinking lots of water and having really healthy thoughts so they're like the foundations of of great health and the foundations of a really healthy libido um the other thing that i can think of is what i've mentioned a few times in in this q a which is seeking support from someone like myself or it, it, you know whoever a therapist and talking about um why it bothers you that you have a low libido and why perhaps you do have a low libido because there's a lot of different reasons why we can experience low sex drive and often it just takes having just talking to one person your best friend or your mom or opening up to someone just talking about it can take the pressure off and 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 just trust that your body 
knows like your body has a low libido for a reason right now and it will change it's not going to be like this forever so you can also go back to just trusting and surrendering into you know what right now i don't feel like sex my friends do i don't that's okay things mm. will change and um accepting is really you know accepting ourselves and and where we're at is just key to just feeling so much lighter and happier Beautiful. Mm. Cool. Thank you so much for that. It was an unplanned one, but I really appreciate you <laughs> no, answering. Um, I think that brings us to the end of our session. Is there anything you'd like to add? Um, no. Well, I guess for people who are listening, if you want to learn more about these topics and if you want to join me in, in like educating yourself more and just feeling more inspired in this area of your life, then you can join me um, on Instagram, which is at Juliet underscore Allen. And then if you want to join me, I'm opening Pleasure School um, on the 29th of this month of July, and it is opening for new student enrollment. And that's a really great and affordable way to commit for 12 months to learning more and, you know, watching lessons and learning from different teachers in the area of sex and relationships. So yeah, there are two, two places that you can find me and um, yeah, feel more inspired around sex. Feel more inspired already. So yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, you're watching Rush Weekend, everyone. This has been Pleasure Time with sexologist Juliet Allen. It's been such a pleasure. Fun, fun. Um, <laughs> Thanks and, uh, for having me, Dre. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Have a great night. Thanks. Everyone. Yeah, you too. Thank you. Bye.